and Graham and Tim, take it away. Great. Thanks, Ryan. So I'm going to start uh, by sharing my screen. Um, and what I want to let you know is we're going to spend quite a bit of time tonight uh, going through the research uh, for the lost Dakotians of the Second World War. Um, and because we're recording this, I want to let you know that if at some point you're thinking, it's getting a little late, these guys have gone on a little long, feel free to drop because we will share the link to the recording and you can just pick up right where you left off. Um, for those of you who are looking at the screen right now, you may, uh, what, I didn't hit the final share button there, did I? There we go, now I did it right. There we go. Uh, some of you may recognize this photo. Um, to me, uh, this is one of the most important photos that we have in our vast collection of photographs from YMCA Camp Dakota's history. This is a flag raising ceremony. This is 1936. Um, this is the boys session. And we can say with reasonable certainty um, that six of the 12 of the lost Tacodians, so the, the Tacodians who served in the Second World War and made the supreme sacrifice, meaning they, they died in the war, are in this photo. Now, we can't be 100% sure, and some of them have their backs to us, but we know they were there. If you're at camp, you're at flag raising, so we think that they are represented in this photograph. And what's remarkable is just last night, somebody put a copy of this photo up for sale on eBay. I don't know how they got it, but I am currently uh, the front runner in the bidding, and I hope to get it and return it to our archives. Hey, Graham, do you want to put this on uh, slideshow so the view screen is bigger? Yeah, so what happens is it uh, it messes up between the two screens whenever I try to do that, Tim, and it because I'm using the double screen, it, it won't work. You can still see it though, right? Yes. Okay, great. Oh, you know what I can do is I can make it bigger like that. So let's talk a little bit about, some of you know who we are, some of you don't know who we are. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, both myself and my co-presenter, Tim. Um, my name is Graham Noseworthy. I am a holder of a CT-16. I was really hoping to earn my CT-17 this summer, but unfortunately uh, we had to make a decision uh, as a board of directors and, and with our staff to shutter. Uh, and closed down uh, Camp Dakota for the 2020 summer season, the first time since 1915 that there is no version of our camp. I am the parent of one camper and one uh, leader corps uh, camper. I am a one-week program, program cabin dad volunteer. I'm a fundraiser, and I'm also the vice president and historian of the Dakota YMCA. Um, uh, so my work as volunteer historian, I have studied and organized organized in finger quotes, that's pretty rough. Our archives back to 1913. I've uh, authored a lot of articles, including the Lost Dakotians, which we'll be discussing tonight. And I created, assembled, and, and helped bury uh, the Centennial Time Capsule, which will safely rest underneath a field until 2041. And in that capsule are assets that represent your family members as well. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Tim, to introduce himself. Dr. Francis. Yes. Um, so I, I only have a CT of one, and that one's honorary from Graham uh, from when <laughs> I was up there last summer. Uh, some of you probably know the story, but uh, I am uh, I am a relative nephew of one of the lost Dakotians, uh, Frederick Allen Stearns. Graham, if you can point him out on the on the photo, he's in the bottom uh, right. Of the photo that's his B twenty nine crew, uh, and and we'll talk about his story later. But I had written an article over twenty years ago uh, on my uncle's story, and it was published in uh, uh, an academic journal. And Graham had found it, and he spent a lot of time trying to find me, and eventually tracked me down. Um, and that's kind of how I got pulled into this project because it was sounded fascinating at the time uh, and still is. And that's why we're still working it. But as you can see here, I'm a, I'm a senior advisory historian for the Naval History and Heritage Command in Washington, D.C. I've worked for them sort of on and off 
uh, since the 1990s uh, as a historian. I'm also a reservist uh, in, in the Navy. And actually that top picture is a picture of me on a cargo plane in Iraq when we were flying that to picture. and Kuwait. Uh, that was in 2006, so I'm significantly younger and obviously don't have a, a white beard at the time. Um, uh, I, I also just threw in there that I, uh, I've authored lots of other pieces, wrote a lot for the Navy, uh, I've been an emergency manager, and uh, right now I'm trying to be a beekeeper, um, which is always fun. Uh, but um, I just I just want to again say it's been an honor to work on this project. Had a have had a really good time. Graham is amazing. Um, everybody I met last summer, you were all amazing. So this has just been uh, a really great great project. Very satisfying to work with Graham and all of you. Likewise, Tim, and it, it has been a lot of fun. And, you know, um, it's important to note, folks, that we are gather, uh, joined tonight by other relatives of the lost Dakotians. Um, and at some point tonight, if you would like to introduce yourselves, we can, we can do that as well. Let's just talk for a minute. Um, I'm just gonna quickly test something, by the way. If I'm trying to, if I open up this other window on my screen here, Ryan, is it still sharing the PowerPoint? Yes, okay, good, that was, I was just testing something. So let me tell you a little bit about where all of this information that we're gonna share from uh, comes from. It is an enormous volume of information. So, you know, a lot of people think, hey, you just go on ancestry.com and type in a few things and, uh, you know, you, you, you can learn just about anything about anyone. Um, that is not true, <laughs> I can assure you. Um, and this was a long process. It took us over a year and we used a lot of information about Dakota and we're going to talk about Dakota tonight. So don't worry. Um, we, we used original documents dating back to December the 8th, 1913, when our Y was founded. We used a lot of board meeting minutes and record books, these really dusty, old, um, very delicate three ring binders that were compiled by all of our former directors, um, executive director history compilations. In fact, I'm going to be re referencing one of them tonight. We actually just made an interesting discovery uh, today that we'll be sharing. Uh, personal interviews with some of the folks that are actually on the phone, testimonial stories, uh, the National Archives of the United States, actually the National Archives and Record Administration, NARA, was a huge help, um, and they continue to send us new information. We just recently received some new information on two of the boys that, were, that we, we did not know about previously. We used federal, state, local, and international records, including the National Archives of the United Kingdom um, and various organizations in France and India. We also used newspaper. Uh, the Historical Society of Cheshire County was incredible. Uh, educational records from schools all over the region. And of course, the uh, Y archives, the actual Y archives of the uh, Y of the USA, and many, 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 many other sources. There was a lot of digging. Uh, that went into this. A lot of hours in this room and a lot of hours working with Tim. But it's important to note that we try to triple confirm everything, um, but we're not always right. The documents are not always right, and it takes a village to do this stuff. So if you have a story that you think you want to share, or if you see something tonight that you think might be a little off, um, or something that has nothing to do with this subject that you think would be interesting to put in our archives, we would love to know. Who's that handsome fellow right there? I don't know. He looks familiar. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of other disclaimer how this is going to work tonight. So right now you're seeing my screen. Um, the screen is going to turn on and off at different times because I'm going to share all different assets. So we're going to tell a story for each of the men, but we're also going to share things that nobody has seen before for each of the men. Um, so it's important that you just kind of bear with us as we move through the process because things will kind of come and go on the screen. It's going to be a little casual, but Ryan will help me with that to make sure that I'm sharing. All right. So for tonight, I'm going to have Tim set the stage. I think it's really important that if we're going to talk about men who courageously, for, at the minimum, 
made the supreme sacrifice in the Second World War, we need to talk about what was happening in the world at that time. So we're going to do a little bit of setting the stage for camp and the war. We're going to go through each one of the men. We're going to spend a few minutes on each man. We're going to talk about Memorial Lodge and how this all started and why Mem Lodge is related to this. The 2019 Memorial Lodge ceremony that some of you were actually at, some new research and discoveries. We're going to talk about the future for this project, what Tim and I are currently working on, and we'll talk, take some of your questions. Okay, Tim, a world on fire. Set the stage. So, <clears throat> so in the in the the mid to late 1930s, and and pardon me if I make if I if I just I'm just going to presume that people know a little bit about the period, but not a, a ton. So what was going on, obviously, everyone probably remembers or knows about the Great Depression. Right? So in the early 1930s, the United States was coming out of the Great Depression, um, but we were very focused on internal development, like trying to get the economy going again, trying to get jobs you know, the, some of those famous Dust Bowl pictures come out of this era. Um, and a lot of uh, FDR's New Deal programs, getting people back to work, that sort of thing. But out in the, wor out in the wider world, there were lo lots of trouble brewing around the world. The, the picture um, on the left is actually in China because the, the Japanese empire actually went to war in China as er, in the early 1930s, um, although it, it really sets, uh, sets itself off in 1937. So even though the United States is at peace and people are thinking internally, there are things going on in the world because the Japanese invasion of China through lots of fits and starts eventually leads to Pearl Harbor because of American interest in what is happening in China. Um, and in Europe at the same time, this is when Nazi Germany, uh, Hitler has come to power in Germany, and they have a very sort of revisionist outlook on the state of affairs in the world. They, the, the, the Nazis were very anti-communist, but they were also anti-capitalist. So, the, and they wanted to overturn what they called the strictures of the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War. So uh, there's trouble brewing, um, but here at home, um, everything seemed like it was safe, safe and at peace. So the boys at camp in the mid 1930s would have no, would have had no idea what was in store for them. I'll turn it over to Graham now. Thanks, Tim. And it's important to note that. When we think about the camp that these boys were primarily exposed to is a very, very different camp from what we know nowadays. And not just because of modern infrastructure or the way camp grew over time. It's a bigger clue than that. It's because they saw camp before the great New England hurricane of 1938. So I like to say, and I'll be talking about this in a future talk, that it's really, there's really a tale of two Dakotas. There's the Camp Dakota from 1916, the one that's in Richmond, all the way through 38, and then there's the camp after that, because uh, Camp Dakota was completely uh, destroyed in 38. Um, but if we think about what was happening very early in camp's history, we are talking about, if you think it's rustic now, <laughs> it was really rustic then. We had tents. There was barely any technical infrastructure. Um, I mean, camp, the weekly camp rate, for example, in 1928, when one of these boys started going, uh, was raised from a whopping $8 to $10. Um, we were just getting electricity for the first time at camp. Uh, we were just, you know, improving our relationship and really getting into being a, a widely recognized part of the community. We were just starting to build permanent cabins, just starting to build permanent buildings. And what's remarkable is that even with the hurricane, mm -hmm. some of those buildings are still present and still in use today. 
a lot of the traditions that we know, traditions, things like CTs, the songs we sing, the classes, the bell, all of these different things, the tower on the dock, um, you know, the old dining hall, which to them was just the, was my dining hall when I was a kid, um, Hobby Nook, uh, candlelight ceremony, a lot of the things that we know now as Tacodians, um, were the exact same things that these boys knew and were experiencing at camp at that time. You know, we had a lot of interesting things uh, that were also going on, like Rosie Smith, a Cherokee Indian student from uh, Bacone College in Oklahoma, was coming out and teaching Indian lore classes. We had actual Native Americans that participated in our programming um, every, every, every year. Now, some of you know that we have multiple divisions at camp. Right now, the oldest division um, is the Kingfishers. The middle-aged kids or, or, or middle group of kids is the crown and shields. Um, and then the lowest are the buffaloes. And those are named for people, Buffalo Bob, Elsie Crown and Shield, uh, Marty Fisher and, and, and Kingfish, who was uh, one of our aquatics directors. But at the time when these guys went, camp was divided into three different uh, names, which still crack me up. Indian Village was for ages eight and a half, nine and 10. <laughs> this next one gets me every time. The Stockade was for ages 11, 12, and 13. And the Frontier was for age 14 and over. So as you can imagine, camp at that time was very basic, very few buildings. There, there, there was no large open fields at that time. There was a, a, the, a, a field, which back then was known as the Brown Athletic Fields, was starting to be developed. B field didn't exist. The area in front of the, uh, where the flagpole is now didn't exist because those were all hemlock groves that were later destroyed by the hurricane. But camp was a place of remarkable peace, of remarkable growth, and was widely known uh, throughout the region. And we'll go a little bit more into camp as we go along. So tonight we're going to get to know these 12 brave men. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to share a few details uh, and then one or two of these digital assets for the men. And that's where I'll have to jump around. Tim and I will go back and forth telling the stories. Um, family members for your story, if you'd like to jump in, you should feel free to do so. You do not have to, but if you'd like to, you can. And for those of you who are, if you hear of a story tonight and you think, ooh, that's a really good one. I want to know that story. Let me teach you how to find this stuff. It's very simple. So if you go to camptakota.org and you click on history under about camp, or uh, you, if you select history under about camp, you can go right to this page and see um, what looks like this whole list of the men. But if you find a story tonight that you're of particular interest in, let's just say, you know, Lawrence Alfred Robinson. Boy, I'm really interested in that guy. All you have to do is search Google for Dakota and Robinson, or, or you can even use the full name, Lawrence Alfred Robinson. And the first thing that comes up will be the links to these pages. So it's really, really simple to find this stuff. Okay, so we're gonna go on. And we and Tim, we will start with Lawrence, Alfred Robinson. Go ahead, sir. So, um, Robinson. So, if you look at, uh, when you read the story, uh, you will see that he, and you, you, and you can see right here, he's born in 1916. So, a little young, or a little older uh, than uh, some of the other boys. He, uh, he attended camp in 1928. Um, and so that was the year apparently that the camp got electricity, um, which must have been exciting. Um, and, but he also would have been 12 years old. Um, and which, as Graham always says, is a great time to go to the, go to the camp. Absolutely. Um, some of the interesting things about uh, Lawrence is if you see the pictures on the screen that that picture that third picture on the right at the top which is which is Lawrence actually wearing a homemade diving helmet that he designed and built and uh, apparently it was through a tube 
two bicycle pumps. <laughs> he would have his, his buddies pump air down into the helmet so he could breathe. And he would go as low as like 40 feet in the water, which is uh, 32 feet is a, is a um, one atmosphere. So that's getting, it's getting pretty far down there. You know, scuba divers don't go, go below 100. So pretty amazing um, that, that, that he could do that. And that kind of brings up my, my uh, the second point I wanted to make was that he, um, he, did, he did very well in school in science and math. In, and he went to a public school in Marlboro. And one of the things that I always bring up to Graham almost every time we speak is just how smart and intelligent these boys were. Um, in almost every case, they are in a technical field. So I don't know if that has to do with the cult, the New England culture of the time, the public schools of the time, I don't know what, but all these boys seem really accomplished. Um, it's, it's something that has always struck me and I always, I always bring that up to Graham and say, how can we explain this better? Um, but the, the, the diving helmet, I just thought is a great example of that. And he did other things. He, he, he apparently built a, um, a little ski sailboat, um, to go across, uh, frozen lakes in the winter. Um, and as you might expect, he becomes an engineer after high school and he works for a um, um a textile plant in where was that oh at minowa manufacturing in marlboro and hampshire so in, in his hometown and what's interesting is that camp is used or the the factory is using machine tools that are made in germany uh, because post um Post 1920s, post World War One in the 1920s, the two big machine tool manufacturing countries in the entire world were Germany and the United States. But they tended to specialize in different things. The U.S. specialized in making uh, specialized machine tools, so they'd make a machine tool to make car parts, for example, um, and that was good because you could train an operator very quickly. The Germans tended to make specialized machine tools that would take a lot more training to get the, the people up to, up to good operating skill. So Lawrence, as the superintendent of this factory, he actually gets sent over to Germany in uh, 1936, so the, after the Nazis have taken power, to spend a year there learning about the machinery and learning German and learning things so he can come back and improve the factory in Marlboro. Uh, one of the interesting things we found out about that story was, so he's living in Nazi Germany for a year, uh, and he he's sort of tied up in all the drama of the remilitarization, remilitarization of the Rhineland and a lot of the politics of the time, and it really sort of turns him off to, he, he sees through sort of the facade of Nazi Germany. And while he's in Germany, he really becomes to appreciate democracy and the fact that the, where he grew up, you know, he had liberty and nobody was bossing him around, telling him what to do. Um, and uh, he had, I'm sure, um, his, had, had learned about constitution, civil rights, right to vote, all that kind of stuff, which, much of that was disappearing in Germany at the time. And so when he, when he comes home by ship in 1937 and walks off the ship uh, down the gangplank, he uh, feels the connection to what freedom means. Um, and when, when Graham found that line, because it's, he said, um, Freedom as a thing I had hardly known existed for 365 days, a thing I had seen a country of people deny. Now it was mine again. And if in fact my friends had the same amount of it, but they did not realize what a wonderful thing it was for it had never been denied them. I, I just found that 
very, very poignant and um, that really gets you in the heart. The um, So what happens is he's working at an engineer and then the war begins in Europe in 1939 and then Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And that's a big day for many of these boys, right? Because that's what gets them thinking about joining uh, the service, uh, whichever service it turns out to be. And so on Pearl Harbor, he starts thinking about what he's going to do and actually almost immediately, 20 days after Pearl Harbor, he joins uh, the United States Army Air Forces. So he's an engineer, he's worked as an engineer, so the, the Army Air Corps would see him as a very valuable asset. And indeed, he actually trains up as a flight engineer, which is the sort of the main, um, the main operational engineer on a bomber. So other people will have different skill sets. You know, the pilots will fly the bomber, the navigator will get it where it needs to go, the gunners will man the defenses, but the flight engineer is critical for making sure the bomber works as a system. So it it is one of the, the more critical um, positions in a bomber crew. Um, but he's a smart kid, uh, a smart guy by then, and, and he, he is able to do that job. Um, can you bring up the patch, the 310th bombardment patch? Graham, if we have that. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Yeah, if not, it's okay. Um, what's interesting about Lawrence, if not, bring up a picture of a B-25. So what's, in, what's interesting about Lawrence is you know, so he joins in December of 1941. In 1942, much of the year is spent in the United States. Kind of, kind of um, uh, preparing to intervene in the war. So the war economy has to get going. We have to mobilize people and get them in the services and start building our armed forces. Um, and so his squadron, which is the 397th bombardment squadron, and that was the patch that Graham just showed. Um, they are actually uh, activated in April of 42, so quite quickly. And um, he is basically ordered overseas in August. So he only has about eight months of training. Um, and as we'll see with some others, later in the war, it becomes much, much longer. So there is a shortened training cycle for everybody. Um, and this may be part of why um, what happens to Lawrence happens. Um, as we'll see, because uh, what happens is in August, uh, they are ordered overseas. Now, people may remember that in November of 1942, is when the first sort of counter offensive against Axis occupied Europe takes place. And that's uh, Operation Torch in North Africa, when we do landings in Morocco and Algeria. Um, and those landings take place from Britain and from the United States. The amphibious convoys go all the way across the Atlantic and will land in Morocco. So this is our first operation. and his squadron is ordered to England to participate in it. Do you have, uh, thank you, Graham, you, you anticipated my next one. So because shipping was really tight at the time, because of U-boats sinking cargo ships all throughout the Atlantic, all the bomber crews were ordered to fly their bombers across the Atlantic. And some bombers could go directly because they had long range, Others had to do it in shorter stops, like from, you can see from Goose Bay to Greenland or Goose Bay to Iceland. Um, some of them could also go all the way. That was typically the fighter route. Um, some of the bombers could go from Goose Bay or Gander across to Scotland. 
and that would that would have been in range of B25s. So what happens is that in September, um, the the squadron departs. I think it's New Jersey. Um, they're in South Carolina doing most of their training. They fly up to New Jersey and then they fly to um, Presque Isle. West, West, well, they go to Westover. Oh, Westover, for, right, right. They go to Westover in Massachusetts and he gets to visit his family for two hours on, on September 10th as he's ready to basically get in a plane and fly overseas to go to war. Um, which must have been a, also a poignant conversation. So he, um, the planes fly to then Presque Isle Air Base in Maine. And that's what this picture is um, that, that Graham has put up. And if you go back to the map, um, they're basically the intention, they refueled there and then they were gonna fly on to Goose Bay. Um, yeah, so they would have been somewhere somewhere around Mingan, but they were, were gonna take the leg up to Goose Bay. And so on 22 September, 1942, they, they, that squadron of eight planes takes off in the morning to do that, but the weather is very bad. I don't know if, if um, if you guys remember today, when the SpaceX launch got canceled, it got scrubbed because of poor weather. Well, on 22 September, you know, the thinking was there's a war on, and so safety rules didn't apply as much back then. So they took off in quite bad weather, um, and about 30 minutes into the flight, the squadron leader realized that two planes were missing. So they ordered them all to go back home. So six planes land back at Presque Isle um, and they find out that one of them has crashed um, and they don't know what happened to the other one. The other one actually had a, had their radio go out and it continued on and actually made it to Goose Bay. So they get briefed again. It looks like the weather is clearing so the six planes, which includes Lawrence's plane, take off again. So this is despite having one of their planes disappear and crash, which they knew about. So they take off again. And the other thing to realize is they were flying with all their spare equipment and repair equipment and toolboxes and supplies. So the planes were very heavily loaded. Um, and that just means it's more difficult for them to take off. Um, and in rough weather, everyone's been on an airplane that goes through storm clouds, right? Um, the plane bounces around. Well, they don't really know what happened, but after that, after the second time the six planes take off, Lawrence's plane crashes um, straight down into the earth uh, in Maine. And explodes and everyone on board is killed. So it's, you know, really nothing to be done because the, the wreckage, um, ah, there we go. So there, there's, there's a piece of a B-25 wreckage in the woods in the Northeast, right? Yeah, the, his, his parts of his plane are actually still there. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, what's, what's interesting about this story is that crash and Lawrence's death and his crewmate's death, as part of the, of the investigation report, the Army Air Corps realizes that they had overloaded the planes. And so they then implement regulations so that doesn't happen again in the future, um, which I thought was also very sort of poignant, at least, you know, getting something out of it that probably saved the lives of other airmen down the road. So what I wanted to share uh, in terms of a never before seen asset um, 
for Lawrence is this is the actual aircraft accident report which we were able to get from um from a, 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 a an investigator actually who lives out in arizona and so this is the actual handwritten report and then it, uh, just to give you a sense of what all this paperwork looked like it's then turned into all of these documents you can see lawrence's name there his serial number his rank um, and so these are the kinds of documents that we had to uh, basically learn to translate. And you can see here, aircraft lost left wing and sharp pull out and crash in wooded area, structural failure. And this document goes on and on and on and on. And basically what it ends up telling us is that this plane was terribly overloaded. Um, and that leads to an investigation. But what you're seeing here is the process that the military went through at that time um, to really be, begin to figure out what had happened. And this gives you a good sense of what some of these documents look like. And let me see if this one, some of these things go on for just hundreds of pages. This one also had um, the uh, news reports. And then there's the actual photographs of the plane um, after it had crashed. There's no bodies or anything here, but these are actual photographs of uh, of Lawrence's plane on the on the ground, uh, right outside the woods of Maine, and the rest of it is still in the woods. Hey, Graham, quick question. Yes, sir. The uh, so that that information came from uh, was it like an enthusiast, like someone who does this, like like you guys do, or? Yeah, great question. Some official person or? Um, so or it's actually an organization called the Aircraft Accident Investigation Committee or Corporation or something like that, AAIC. And I had to work with the guy and basically they help you track down the documents you need. So what you have to do is we had to do a lot of homework up front to figure out the aircraft and then be able to get him the report. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's a matter of giving him clues and he goes and finds it. Other times we had to just give him the very specific information. With Lawrence, we were able to be very specific and he provided the report to us. Very cool, fellas, move thank on. you. Yeah, Tim, we're gonna have to uh, speed up just a little bit on these stories, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through Gail Philip Newell. Now, Gail Philip Newell, uh, who was born in 1918, uh, got his CT3 in 1933. Um, Gail was just this wonderful young man. He was actually born William James Easty on April the 10th, uh, 1918. Now you have to think about, and this is incredibly poignant, especially for today, what was happening in Boston, Massachusetts um, at that time. It was being ravaged by an outbreak of influenza. Um, now, William James Easty was the fifth child uh, of a family who just, it appears could not afford to keep him. He was given up for adoption and he was adopted by a wonderful family called the Newells um, in um, East Swansea, New Hampshire. So not far from where camp is. And he was baptized and subsequently given a new name, Gail Philip Newell. And you can see Gail here who was just a wonderful boy. And here he's actually very proudly wearing a potato sack uh, as a Halloween costume. Now, Gail lived a very decent life um, and, um, you know, went to the Keene Public Schools, lived in a, 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 a lovely house in, in, uh, with a shiny 1929 Dodge. And at the age of 13, he registered to attend YMCA Camp Dakota. Uh, as a first time camper, he actually enjoyed the newly constructed cabins, some of which are still in use today. He slept on very modern double decker uh, bunks that were uh, had hay stuffed mattresses, and he kept coming back to camp. He came back several times, um, and by all accounts, we've been able to see that he loved it. We actually have some of his original registration cards. Uh, we have those for a lot, um, and he signed them. He was a really good in the classroom. Um, he attended Keene High School. And in the yearbook from 1936, I loved this. The, the quote about Gail just says, we know Gail will make a swell postman. And the thing about that is that's what Gail wanted. All he wanted was a simple suburban some, you know, life with a, where he could raise a family and just be happy. But before that could happen, 
um, he decided to do his patriotic duty um, and give back. So on September the 29th, 36, at a recruiting station in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, just up the road from where I live here in Lemonster, Massachusetts, Gail filled out NRB form number 24 and respectfully requested permission to enlist in the United States Navy. His high school teacher, Mr. Frederick Stearns, um, who is the father of Frederick Allen Stearns, who is Tim's uncle. So th this is all very connected. The connections here are, are, are really amazing. Um, he actually had Gail in class and stated that he, he's known him for years. He was a very good guy. He was a small town boy, somewhat spoiled at home, which I thought was hilarious, but otherwise had excellent possibilities. And we know this quote from Mr. Stearns because we were able to get Gail's official military personnel file from the military. Um, it's from the National Archives. It's about 150 pages or more. And it has every single thing from that boy's life, uh, including these letters of recommendation. Gail was processed into the United States Navy on the uh, 11 March 1937 at a Navy receiving station in, in Springfield, Massachusetts, and he began his recruitment training at uh, his recruitment training at Naval Training Station in Newport, Rhode Island. He did very well in swimming. Uh, he was a tribute to the classes which uh, to that he took at camp because we know he was a very good swimmer at camp. Um, and he was noted as being intelligent, which goes back to what Tim said earlier. These boys were very smart. He goes through his training, and while he's stationed, um, he met a lovely friend of a friend named Irene Lillian Batine. They fell in love and were married on October the 19th, 1939, uh, by a justice of the peace at City Hall in Westport, Massachusetts. Um, always thinking a few steps ahead, Gail had filed paperwork for a commutation of rations uh, the day before so that they could establish living quarters away from the station once they were married. He didn't want to take his wife into the barracks, I'm sure. A couple of months later, Gail was promoted to pharmacist first class, or, or I'm sorry, pharmacist mate third class. Uh, he learned some medical skills, and with the war escalating in 1940, um, he knows he, uh, it's starting to get pretty serious. Um, he is transferred to headquarters supply company of the 5th Marines, Fleet Marine Force at Naval Torpedo Station, Newport. And now he finds out he's going to be a father. So his son, Gail Douglas Newell, uh, was born and being a good guy, uh, Gail took an honorable discharge in March 21st, 1941. He had served his four years. He was, he was done. He was out. Uh, and this picture here is Gail right around that time, uh, this picture that I'm pointing at. But the war got in the way of his plan to return to civilian life and settle down. Uh, so he re-enlisted. Um, he felt the call. He went back. Um, he was uh, fit for sea duty. Um, and he went off. Uh, the social pressure and the uh, desire to go, which he did not have to, but the country and the Navy needed him, so he went. Um, but he didn't just disappear one day. I mean, he makes these decisions with his family. The, this is what true leadership looks like, right? He'd seen it at camp. He'd seen it in the schools. He'd seen it from Mr. Stearns. He'd seen it, seen it, seen it. So um, they made the difficult decision together, and on uh, March the 5th, he officially reinstates um, he is reports to the USS Barton, a destroyer, a brand new Benson class destroyer. You can see the Barton here, DD-599. Um, and she, the, on the day she's commissioned at the Boston Navy Yard on the 29th of May, 1942, Gale was blown away by the ship. It was sleek. We know this from his letters. It was fast. It was armed to the teeth. It had these guns. They called them Chicago pianos for the way they recoiled. And it had these big 21-inch torpedo tubes capable of unleashing these deadly tin fish. She was under the command of Lieutenant Commander Douglas Harold Fox, a Naval Academy grad uh, with a distinguished reputation. And they put to sea. Um, but, you know, destroyer life is a a really hard life. Um, it's not glorious. It's not uh, what you might think of life on, you know, some fancy aircraft carrier. And what they used to say was there's too much red tape on those big ships. On a destroyer, you know everybody with their good sides and their faults, and everybody knows you. You can't sham on a destroyer. You got to be a sailor, mister. 
Uh, now they go on and they uh, start their tour and they are uh, following the landings in the Solomon Islands. Um, they move on uh, as a reinforcement. They get assigned uh, to, let's see, um, Operation Shoestring, which was, was jokingly called. Um, and the destroyer starts sailing through the Pacific. And Gale was lear learned at that point, he was appointed a pharmacist mate, uh, second class. So this goes on, they're going through their combat, they're going through training, um, they're going through uh, the, uh, the Battle of Cape Esperance, so part of the Guadalcanal. They're doing all these different things. And actually what's interesting is Gale ends up uh, fighting in a battle that another of the Lost Dakotians named Raymond Miley Kreps also fought in. So they actually didn't know that they were in the same place at the same time. Um, on 25th October, they get into some pretty heavy combat um, off uh, in an arc off the uh, Santa Cruz Islands. Uh, and it starts to get pretty nasty from there. Um, the USS Hornet is struck by torpedoes. Uh, Barton actually suffered a puncture wound. Um, Northampton, which was named after the town that I grew up in, was involved in that, was actually helping um, put out fires. Um, and Barton just kept fighting. Um, and it goes on and on and on as this day of fighting continues. Um, and eventually the Barton um, on uh, November um, is involved in, a, in another fight. And as she is fighting, um, two massive explosions blow out the bottom of the destroyer, breaking Barton in half um, as the warship's midsection disintegrated. And she just disappeared in fragments um, and was gone. So according to radio man Jack Slack, a few lookouts, gun crews, and men uh, said that they just had no chance to jump over the side. She just went under the water and pharmacist mate second class Gail Philip Newell, who was at his battle station below decks, just forward of the engine room, was killed without warning along with 163 of his shipmates. Um, the family received telegrams um, and Irene was left to care for the children. Um, and they would receive his Purple Heart um, and those medals and Gail's rank and insignia and service medals are hung in the family's house to this day. Now, what's interesting, and I'll share this and then we'll move on to Raymond Kreps. What's interesting is this is a picture of Barton where she rests on the bottom of the Pacific. And Dr. Robert Ballard found her. Dr. Robert Ballard also found the RMS Titanic. And he said, I'll never forget our first look at Barton. And we always imagined that that was exactly how Gail had felt when he first saw his ship. Him. Now I'm the one taking too long. Let's go through Raymond Miley Kreps because this is one of our favorite stories. And let's see if we can do it in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, okay. So um, another Navy guy, um, which is always... Uh, close to my heart. Um, so, uh, Kreps, uh, he, they actually called him Creeps at the Naval Academy because um, the Navy always likes to give people nicknames. Um, he also went to camp when he was 12 in 1931. Uh, apparently a very active uh, kid. He, when he, uh, he does well in science and math in um, in high school, and then he also spends a little, goes to college at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute um, for engineering and math, does, does very well, and uh, then gets accepted into the Naval Academy in uh, 1938. And we found the medical record of um, his, his sort of entrance medal exam into the Naval Academy, and it is just full of all the scars and bumps and bruises that he had gotten as a kid, probably a bunch of them at the camp. Um, there's a, uh, what is it? The, uh, they had, he had nine notable scars on his hands, legs and torso and his skull. 
He was missing the tip of his ring finger and had a <laughs> scar in his abdomen. So yeah, he probably played really hard. Um, and, and he did well in, he did really well in sports at the Naval Academy. And he actually was a surprisingly good singer. Like they noticed that um, in um, what's the lucky bag is their yearbook. Um, yeah, that's his, that's his picture in the middle. He probably did well with the, with the ladies in Annapolis as well. Um, what's interesting about his class is that uh, they graduated early because he was set to graduate in the spring of 1942. But after Pearl Harbor, the Navy basically advanced the entire class and graduated them almost immediately. I think it was uh, 12 days after Pearl Harbor, the entire class is immediately graduated and commissioned and then assigned um, to units almost immediately because all the, the Navy ships needed to be filled out to their maximum crews. So just like, um, just like some of the others, it's a very quick training process for, uh, for Raymond. Um, as an aside, it has nothing, it's, it's not comparable, but in my first mobilization to Iraq for the Navy in 2006, I was given two weeks notice um, before I basically had to go start the training pipeline. So I kind of know what it feels like, what it must have felt like for him to go through this, this really rapid training program. But again, really smart uh, man. He is a mathematician, engineer. So he actually becomes a radar officer. So at the time, radar was a brand new technology. So he is on the cutting edge of technology um, and is assigned that picture in the on the left is of uh, battleship South Dakota. Uh, yeah, there's a radar station in the ship. So he's he's a gunnery officer in a battleship, which has a crew of thousands of, of uh, officers and men. Um, their main armament were these 16 inch uh, uh, cannons. Um, thanks, Graham, these are great pictures. You can see the radar mast on the very top of the, of the ship. And basically in the stack there um, uh, is a little tiny radar room, sort of below the, um, the cross yard arm, uh, Graham right in that sort of mid height of the, of those, of that tower is where Graham's um, battle stage, or where Raymond's, uh, Raymond's, Raymond's battle station would have been. Um, so a, a couple of other interesting things after he finishes radar school, he gets assigned to, to uh, South Dakota and doing some training and stuff off the East Coast. And he gets a couple days leave and he gets married to a woman named Janet Wheeler in New York City. We don't know how we met her um, uh, or anything. It was just boom, he gets leave, he's in New York, Justice of the Peace marries them in a couple hour cer ceremony at City Hall or probably five minute ceremony. And they get to spend a two day, he goes back to the ship and she never sees him ever again. Um, so uh, uh, one of those wartime tragedies. Um, so he, but you know, it's, it's 1942, the summer of 42, there's heavy fighting starting in the South Pacific against the Japanese Navy, which is a, a very equivalently advanced technology, large capable Navy, a, probably the most determined naval foe the U.S. Navy has ever fought. Um, so a very, very tough uh, campaign in the Pacific. And so uh, Raymond and gets sent there in South Dakota in August of 42. And uh, like, like Graham, uh, Graham mentioned, um, in October, there's what's called the Battle of Cape Esperance, which was uh, a carrier battle where the ships never sighted each other um, on the surface, but it was 
airstrikes between aircraft carriers launching planes to target the enemy ships. Um, and uh, what, what uh, Raymond did is he used the radar set to give warnings to the ship about approaching air, Japanese airstrikes because the radar could see the Japanese planes about 50 or 60 miles out, so much farther than the human eye. And that enabled the US forces to, you know, bring in fighter planes and have them go after the Japanese bombers and prepare anti-aircraft guns like um, to, to fire at the approaching planes. So the, the battle's pretty intense. Um, I don't think South Dakota actually takes much damage. She takes a few hits, but the, the Japanese aircraft are really going after the aircraft carriers because that's the biggest threat. Um, and uh, what, what Graham was talking about with Newell was after the battle, all the ships retire um, a couple hundred miles to the east to refuel. They meet oil tankers at sea and they take on fuel and maybe some more ammunition for the guns, et cetera, et cetera. And during that refueling operation, both the Barton and South Dakota are in the same piece of water on the same day at the same time. And there's a Tacodian on each ship, but they don't know the other person is there. Um, and sort of the fascinating thing is just a few days later, they will both end up at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, very close to each other a second time, and this time for all time. Uh, we just, Graham and I just found that very, very touching. So what happens is on the night of 12, 13 November is when what, what happened is, is that the U.S. Navy is trying to get supplies into Guadalcanal because there are Marines fighting the Japanese on the island. And so they have to get these supply convoys in, and that's why the ships are going into what's called Iron Bottom Sound. Uh, and that's because of the number of ships that get sunk there. Graham, can you bring up the, picture, the, the shipwrecks for um, Iron Bottom Sound? Uh, yep. Hold on one second. Yeah, there's, there's the, we go into great detail because we have the after action reports. You can bring up an after action report too, if you could. But we go into great detail on the course of the battle. And, and basically, Raymond is helping direct the fire of the ship's guns by spotting the Japanese ships in the dark by using his radar set. And uh, yeah, this is a list. That map is a list of all the ships that were sunk during the five or six month campaign over Guadalcanal. So these, these ships are sunk on, you know, there's probably a dozen and a half different engagements that lead to all these ships being sunk there. Um, you know, and as you can see, Barton was in there. Uh, South Dakota isn't sunk, but on that battle, um, some Japanese uh, gunfire savages the the whole upper decks of South Dakota and I think they get something they get something like 28 shell hits yeah that's a diagram of every single hit that they took um, and if you want to I think it's hit number what is it 13 14 15 um, it, it goes through the superstructure and those are the shells that go through Raymond's compartment and he and everybody in that compartment is pretty much killed instantly. Um, then, uh, yeah, that's that's actually a damage report photo of the actual compartment. So Raymond so, was sitting right there. Yeah, just completely wrecked um, by by the shell hits. Um, that's now the what, open. That, that's open to the sea, by the way. That's the sea in the background. What you're seeing there. Those are the one, two, three shell hits that came right through. Right. Yeah. Um, now, what what the other thing that we found sort of really uh, interesting about Raymond's story is the crew, because the ship is in a battle, a war zone, they're way out in the middle of the South Pacific. Um, there are no sort of structures there are no morgues or anything, and there's not enough room on the Navy ship to have a morgue. So all the any casualties are buried at sea. You want to bring up that picture, Graham? 
So this is the ceremony where Raymond and his shipmates uh, were buried. There's this picture, and you can see they're 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 just wrapped in shrouds. And actually, the tradition was to put a shell, um, a gunnery shell, at their feet to weigh to weigh them down. Uh, and then the chaplain would uh, have the ceremony, and then they would carefully, sort of respectfully, commit the bodies to the to the deep. Um, I've actually been on an aircraft carrier when we did a burial at sea. Um, the they were the person had been cremated, so it was it was uh, easier. It was just a box of ashes, um, although and. And I don't mean to make light of it, but there, when the carrier I was on when we did this, it was a chief petty officer who was uh, a master chief, which is the highest enlisted rank. And his, his ashes were put on a ramp and they only slid partially down. The box got stuck halfway down. And uh, we used to, we, I was with some other chiefs because I'm, I'm also a chief petty officer. And we joked that the master chief didn't want to leave the Navy. Um, but so they finally they have a little pull for when that happens because it's not unusual and they reach down and, and uh, finally committed him to burial at sea but anyway it just um i was struck by the burial at sea photos um as, as kind of the um the, the the final resting place of raymond um which wouldn't have been very far from the final resting place of newell you know, one thing that I, I wanted to share uh, for Raymond is this is Raymond's final letter home. Um, this, this really, I found this to be tremendously moving, this letter. This, so this was written just days before he died. He died on November the 15th. This letter was written on the 12th. So obviously the family members would have received it after he had died. But, you know, he actually, so he talks about his love for his mother, you know, taking, making sure his wife is taken care of. Don't send me any presents, just buy yourself something nice. And he actually talks, I mean, we make the joke about American and apple pie. He actually makes a comment in here somewhere about apple pie. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, this is as, you know, as American as you get. Um, but we also get to see his 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 signature right so we have these little things from a lot of these men these letters home that are incredibly poignant um and really 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 special to uh special to see um i'm gonna go through uh philip douglas parody this this one is interesting philip was born in 1922 um, when he first started at Camp Dakota, it was actually the same year that we were given a plot of land by a woman named Mrs. Kate Davis. Uh, she donated a small patch of land that we, we now know as D Field or Davis Field, um, because at the time our wise property was rapidly expanding. Keep in mind when Dakota was founded, we had, to, um, uh, let's see, I think we had 62 acres and now we have um, over 500. Um, you know, Philip was a good kid, good student, very intelligent, um, was in the biology club, dramatic club, French club, was a, uh, it was in Demole, which is like a part of the, almost like a, a Freemasons organization. He was a past master counselor, which is a very big deal. He had a job. Um, he had a, a girlfriend that he loved very much, who was affectionately known as Puggy, and I'll come back to her in a little while. But Philip, just like Lots of boys on the 31st of December, 1941, he enlisted. He was five feet, eight inches tall, and he weighed about 125 pounds, and he joined in Springfield, Massachusetts. Philip was processed through uh, uh, Rhode Island. Um, he learned like a lot of boys did by doing. He earned about 21 bucks a month. He served on board a ship called the Wyoming, which was a tra uh, training uh, ship. Um, he was eventually promoted to seaman apprentice second class, and he started taking quartermaster sea school where he learned navigation, chart reading, compass, gyro, ship steering. Um, and he absolutely loved being a sailor. But what he really loved was when he was transferred to submarine training school. 
and he worked really, really hard through his training. And in fact, um, a lot of people say, uh, or not a lot of people, James Elphick, who wrote We Are the Mighty in 2017, said life aboard World War II submarines was brutal. Each crew member had about one cubic foot of personal storage space. Each crew member had a bunk scattered throughout the many compartments of the boat, including the torpedo rooms, and as many as 14 men crammed into the forward torpedo room, along with 16 torpedoes. So a submarine that size couldn't fit the necessary provisions for long war patrol, so they would go out and come back, but they also stashed food, boxes of food every where they could. But Philip loved it. And after he graduated submarine school in late March 1943, he was transferred to the submarine service. He made his way to Hawaii. He joined veteran fleet boat USS Plunger uh, on 18 April 1943, and they did some training exercises in and out of Pearl Harbor. Um, and in fact, at one point, um, they had a real problem on that boat, but he didn't panic, stayed nice and cool, and he was recognized for that. Um, the plunger was ordered to the Marshall Islands, uh, where they did all sorts of training work, and including a steel beach picnic where they had a beach party with some beer. Um, and eventually, um, he did more and more work on the plunger, but was eventually... Um, let me transferred. just skip it. Yeah, he was eventually transferred to Pompano. Pompano. Um, so in the summer, in July, he was transferred. Uh, let's see, that would be July. Uh, let me see if I've got this right. And uh, Tim, while Graham is looking at that, do we have any idea where Philip grew up? Um, let's see. I don't remember off the top of my head, but let me... We do. Uh, I can tell you that. Philip grew up... I have his card here somewhere. Mm, I can't find it that quickly, but we do know exactly where he grew up. This right, right down to the street. But eventually, uh, after lots of work, Philip was transferred to a ship named the Pompano. And the Pompano uh, goes out and um, gets into combat. She's sighted by two freighters, um, and they start to fight it out. Um, a, a destroyer comes along, and they start to fight it out. Um, and so the Pompano starts to have some pretty significant issues where they're going out, they're having problems, they're coming back. Going out, having problems, coming back. They're not having a very successful cruise. Um, and the boys are starting to get pretty frustrated. Um, on the night of 17 July, uh, 1943, they uh, sight a large fishing vessel and they start firing their three inch shells at 900 yards um, and eventually end up hitting it with everything they possibly could on board the ship. Um, and two thirds of it was submerged with her fisherman crew dead or in the water. Pompano's final attack of the patrol took place on 20th July. Um, and they were again, pretty frustrated. So they go back, um, really unable to make any substantial naval kills, so to speak. Uh, sorry if I'm not saying that correctly, Tim, but you know what I mean? Um, and the patrol was labeled unsuccessful. Um, and they regretted that more damage was not done. So by this time, Philip had had a chance to read and respond to his mail. He received some wonderful letters from Puggy. We have those letters. Um, he very carefully crafted his responses so that nobody could tell where he was. Um, and three weeks after arriving at Midway, a refitted and resupplied Pompano uh, goes out on patrol and she is never heard from again. A post-war review uh, suggests strongly that Pompano was likely, uh, the Pompano actually likely did have some success and sank the Akama Maru, a 6,000 ton cargo ship. Um, and while it was initially thought Pompano had struck a mine, Japanese records indicate that on the morning of 17 September, um, a float plane um, which spotted an oil uh, slick uh, it turns out that the float plane had dropped depth charges and it looks like she sank uh, the ship. 
uh, the sub. So Philip's family is notified, and this is where it just turned in a direction that I couldn't believe. Philip's family is notified. The father leaves work, goes and tells the mother. They're sitting in Central Square in Keene, having this conversation, totally devastated at the loss of their son. Philip's mother stands up, goes to the local jewelry store, buys an engagement ring, brings it to Puggy, tells Puggy that Philip has, is presumed lost and, is, and, and presumed, or is lost and presumed dead, gives her the engagement ring and said, this is what he would have given you when he would have come home. And the family still has the ring. Uh, the Pompano received seven battle stars for her service, and despite repeated attempts by the Navy, the wreck has never been found. Tim, I'm going to have you tell the story of Lieutenant Leonard Abbott Spike Merrill Jr. And folks, I want to point out that we are actually joined tonight uh, by Spike's son uh, and his daughter-in-law, uh, Dick and Joan Merrill, are on the line. Um, and Tim, I'm just going to I know we're having a lot of fun here, but we're now pushing 815, so we're going to have to speed it up a little bit. But this is a good story, so I'll have you uh, work your way through that one, please. Okay. Um, I'll, the, the problem with this material is it's so great and fascinating. We, could, we just want to talk all night. And I know we can. So, again, a, another um, foot stomp for look at the website, and, and you can see all the, all the details that we've come up with. Um, so, uh, Leonard Merrill, uh, who very quickly um, picks up the nickname Spike, um, uh, also went to camp the first time when he was 12 uh, in 1929. He actually meets another um, Dakota camper there, Robert Slade, um, who is sort of our mystery uh, camper, um, which hopefully we can get to later. Uh, some of the interesting um, tidbits was, you know, he grew up and worked on a farm as as a boy, um, but he had a he had an initiative and a smarts about him. Uh, one of the cool things we discovered was that in high school, he uh, he sold milk and crackers during recess on the side. Um, uh, you know, he worked on a farm, so clearly he had access to those things. And he could make a little money doing a side hustle while he was at school, um, which maybe summed him up. Um, but again, yet another smart um, public school guy who goes on to MIT, another engineer. Um, he joins the Army Reserve in 1939, which was unusual for, for the time. Um, and... Uh, he actually gets a job as an engineer at a fire insurance company. And he, while he was finishing up at MIT, he met um, a woman named Dorothy Barr because, you know, as the joke went, he needed someone to type up his paper, his final paper. Um, so that's why he struck a conversation, struck up a conversation with her. Um, but uh, so they, they, they met and they were married in October 1940. Um, he at this time is working in Buffalo, but he keeps coming back to, uh, um, I think it's, what is it, Peterborough, um, to, to see his family. Um, he, again, after Pearl Harbor, he's probably got no choice about it anyway, but the reserve units are all activated, um, and he is assigned to an artillery unit. It's actually the 83rd Chemical Mortar Battalion, um, and these are um, these are all artillery units um, at this time are sort of the tech. They're that's a very technical field in the army. You know, there's ballistics, there's a lot of math, there's um, a lot of science, and in particular with the chemical mortar battalions. They were firing uh, white phosphorus shells, which were basically smoke shells, to basically provide um, short-term cover for infantry or armor or other units on the offensive or on defensive. So it was a, again, it was a, a technical job, um, and he was a, he was 
an officer in that um, in that unit. Uh, uh, actually, and he was uh, he was actually they did a lot bunch of training down in Georgia, and he actually ended up on the senior staff of the unit as the main intelligence officer for the chemical battalion. So that was a very um, a very prestigious uh, position. So he um, um, he basically deploys in uh, May of April of nineteen forty three. So torches already happened. The Allies have liberated North Africa, um, and so the chemical battalion is basically sent as a reinforcement for the North African campaign uh, because we're starting the U.S. in the Mediterranean is starting to eye um, Italy because the Italians are seen as a, a weaker partner in the Axis alliance and um, maybe we can throw by land by doing a landing in Italy maybe we can um, knock uh, the Italians out of the war uh, and this might lead to a, an Axis collapse. So in um, so he's for the first part of this um, period in this, the summer of '43, he's sort of stuck in Algiers doing a lot of paperwork, um, and he actually uh, there's a landing, the first landing um, in June uh, or July, sorry, is when the U.S. troops land in Sicily, and he's not in the first wave, and he but the one of the companies is, and he ends up going to Sicily um, in a follow-on reinforcement to basically help the, the mortar company as Sicily is liberated that summer. Uh, then, uh, which, which have that picture that um, Graham showed of the troops marching through the town was from the Sicily campaign. So what's, what's sort of fascinating is in September, the Italian government collapses and Mussolini, um, is, uh, Mussolini's government collapses and the Italians are um, basically go out of the war. But the German army occupies most of Italy. So while, it, while the, the campaign did accomplish its main goal, it didn't, it didn't accomplish its strategic goal, which was to completely liberate Italy. The Germans beat us to the punch and um, so that meant we had to re we had to invade Italy proper, and so this is where um, um, it becomes difficult. There's fighting in southern Italy, in the mud and the winter of the fall of '43, October, November, uh, September. Very bad weather, miserable fighting conditions. Um, yeah, here's a good example of. Um, of it. You can see it's cold. They've got gloves on and several layers. They've also got their mouths open because the overpressure from firing the mortars um, would give them headaches. Um, and uh, the, the shock wave of shooting off those large shells would just wear, wear, them, wear them down. A very, very tough, grueling, grueling work. They were supporting infantry, in the infantry on the front line with these, and they they would get because they were uh, res, that those are pretty small mortars. They actually got they were essentially in the front line themselves. Um, so also a very dangerous uh, job. And um, during this uh, during this time, Spike actually uh, comes down with jaundice. Um, and is sent back to Italy to recover. And I think he writes um, several letters while he's recovering in Italy, uh, Sicily. So he, he flies back to Italy in December and the next stage of the operation is a landing um, up the coast in Italy to try to go around the mountain ranges south of Rome. And so this is uh, what becomes known as the Anzio landings near Salerno. Um, and uh, they're doing it in January of 1944, so the weather can be bad. It's in the middle of winter. So even though it's the Mediterranean, a much calmer climate than a lot of other places, 
it still can be tough when the weather gets bad. Um, and that sort of, you know, here's a, here's a map. You can see the, the amphibious operation is basically they're trying to outflank um, that, that heavy defensive, German defensive line in the mountains. So the landing, um, initial landings go, go reasonably well uh, in January um, and they get a foothold um, on the on the 22nd and then and part of the 83rd is there and then the rest of the third is sent as reinforcements and so four days later on the 26th of January they're off of Anzio um, it's dark it's at night and the weather is really bad what happens in these types of operations is that reinforcement ships have to basically just sit and wait for dock space to open. And that's what happens in this, in this case, they're just waiting and a bad, bad storm blows up and the ships start to get the pulled by the currents and the heavy waves and their, their anchors will basically drag through the, the sandy bottoms and the rock bottoms. And so the ships get pushed and, and it's dark and there's, rain and they can't tell where they are. Um, they know they're sliding, but they can't really tell where they are. And Graham, do you want to bring up that picture? But basically around five o'clock in the morning, they get dragged into a minefield and a, and a, um, a, a mine sets, blows up and essentially sets this, this landing ship, which is full of men and vehicles and also a lot of artillery ammunition. And what you can see here is some of the smoke shells, the phosphorus white phosphorus smoke shells blowing up and making this incredibly devastating uh, event that was caught on, caught on the photo. Um, the spike actually survives the initial explosions and then because there are repeated explosions on the ship and but what happens is the ship is burning, so people have to abandon ship. So he goes in the water with um, hundreds of other crewmen, and they are rescued. They're, it's dark when they first go in, uh, and they spend hours in this icy water. And a bunch of other Navy ships show up, and they, they rescue um, uh, dozens and even hundreds of the men. I don't have the number handy. Um, but Spike is not one of them, and he ends up um, uh, dying in the water, uh, along with a lot of his um, a lot of his comrades. Um, yeah, I don't see the number, um, but the the you know a, a tragic ending, um, and uh, uh, one of the the. One of the things we 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 found um, was well we we discovered that Spike's cenotaph he, his name is listed on the tablet of the missing at the Sicily Rome Cemetery. Um, yeah, there it is. Hey Tim, just a quick question: uh, Do we know the name of the transport ship? We do. Uh, it was the LST four twenty two. Yes. Thank you. So be, because um, uh, because the LS, LSTs were, were not given actual ship names, they were the same thing as their, their hull designation. So it was landing ship tank um, is what LST stands for. And during our research, what we discovered is we suspect that um, Spike was actually injured because we know he was a strong young man. We know he was a competent swimmer. We know uh, that he helped to get a lot of uh, his uh, men to the back of the ship to have the, I'm sorry, to the front of the ship, I believe, one or the other, to go down the anchor chain. That's how they got into the water. So he made sure they got in before he did. And we know that he just kind of went in the water, slipped in and was never seen again. And we suspect that he may have been injured and wanted to ensure that his that the men uh, under his command got off first. And 
Um, you know, we'll never know for sure, but when we look at the evidence, there are some conclusions that we can essentially jump to. And, and Tim and I have talked about this one a lot, and we think Spike was, was, was probably injured. Now, uh, what's interesting, and I'll just quickly tell this, is that Spike's son, Dick, who is on the phone, went on to marry a woman who coincidentally had attended YMCA Camp Dakota. Um, and just this last summer, we actually presented Joan with her 10-year jacket, which was, which was pretty cool. Um, Graham, interesting. Yeah. what do you think we... Uh, if we do uh, one more, that'll be six. Let's do that. Why don't we, because of the families that we have on, why don't we do uh, George Toomey? Because we've got some representatives from his family on. So I'm going to jump to, I'll just go through these pretty quick. So Robert Douglas Lancy was a, um, an engineer. He was actually a map maker in the Burma uh, China Burma initiative and died in a plane crash. He was actually died non battle. It was a crash. The pilot had been partying, but Robert was a very smart man, was actually a, a long time to coding. He was a leader, actually. Private first class Chester Lyman Beanie Kingsbury. For those of you who live in the Key New Hampshire area, may recognize the name Kingsbury. Uh, Beanie was also a wonderful, smart young man who did lots of different things in school. This is actually a picture of Beanie at camp. Um, we have him there. Beanie was in combat in France, uh, was shot and killed. His body actually laid where it fell for two years, was later buried in a church, uh, exhumed many years later, identified, shipped home. Um, and we recently reunited um, a very interesting artifact from, from Beanie's life. We actually brought it to his grave recently. And if you're interested, I, I highly recommend reading that story to find out about that particular uh, thing that we brought to his grave. It's a fascinating story of how we found it. Second Lieutenant William Thomas Billy Burroughs, wonderful young man, uh, served in the United States Army Air Forces, another brilliant young a uh, hardworking student, great Dakotian. Um, Billy actually participated in one of the largest aerial bombardments um, throughout the war. On the way back, his ship, his plane um, had been hit so many times that the engines were starting to feather. They were 2,500 yards from their landing zone, uh, uh, from their runway in England. Uh, when one of the engines kicked out, the plane dipped a little bit, hit a tree, uh, and crashed, um, and we have the Billy's accident report. We actually have a lot on on, on Billy Burroughs, fascinating young man. His family joined us at camp this past yeah, summer. And I will say, if you go anywhere in East Anglia, um, in in England, you can see the the remnants of the literally hundreds of airfields that that were built there, um, and um, it's. You know, there are still operating bases in England that, um, you know, like RAF Molesworth, for example, is a base in England that they still use. And that was constructed during the war as a as an Air Force, uh, as an Air Force base just built in the middle of these fields in in um, southeastern England. Um, so Billy is actually one of the Dakotians that is in this photo from 1936 that we talked about earlier, but uh, Billy's story is, is a, certainly a story of heroism and heartbreak and another really powerful one to read. Uh, Robert Henry Bob Slade um, is actually a famous Dakotian because he won um, the road race at Dakota in 1932, uh, I believe. Uh, we have lots of records and, and things talking about Bob. He was clearly very well known. Um, Bob served in the United States Army. Um, while he was serving, his wife uh, also decided that she would serve to her the best of her ability and was a parachute packer. Worked uh, very, very hard. 
We are not 100% sure what happened to Bob. We're still working with the, uh, with the Army, with the National Archives and Record Administration. We just recently got his individual deceased personnel file. Uh, we were hoping it would tell us more than it did, but we believe um, in 1945, Bob was actually uh, in the midst of an intense firefight and was probably the victim of misdirected shell uh, misdirected shelling. We know the 10th um, Mountain Division um, suffered misdirected shelling in the same area on the same day, and we suspect and we will eventually confirm that's what happened to Bob as well. Yeah, he, he served in a light armored company. That's why the pictures of the small reconnaissance tanks are on there. Yep, yep. I'm going to uh, spend just a couple of minutes talking about uh, George Frederick Toomey. Uh, George's family um, is on, on the phone. I know. Great photo. A handsome young man. Here he is at Camp Dakota. You can see him right there. Um, so this is a story that is is really important to share. And I'm gonna we're gonna go just a little bit later, folks. So again, if you've got a drop, please feel free to do so. But we'll go through this story and then we'll wrap up the other two, uh, and we'll be done. This story is important because this is not just a story about George. This is a story about his whole family. And, and 1934 was a very difficult year uh, for the Toomey family. In February, Alice Toomey, George's mother, uh, Alice Toomey's husband, George Brendan Toomey, a steam fitter turned uh, HVAC salesman, had suddenly died of pneumonia. George was a Canadian immigrant from Prince Edward Island. Um, and he had uh, uh, eventually settled in Keene. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Alice also had two, uh, two elder daughters, Gladys and Marguerite, from a previous marriage to a gentleman named Harvey Clark that had ended in divorce. Um, and, but she also had her children, uh, George, who was born in 1925, Winifred, who was born in 1927, and Bernard, who was born in 1930. So this is a Brady Bunch that now does not have a father. So this is a very difficult situation. It would be difficult now, but, you know, this was a time when, I mean, it would have been exceedingly difficult uh, for a woman. So the situation that she was facing was extremely challenging. She was widowed, she was unemployed, and she was left to care for five children. And they were in the family home at 60 Adams Street in Keene. Um, so this was a tough time, but Alice was a woman of, let me see here, of, uh, let me move this over. There she is with uh, the children there and a cat. You can see George is on the left. Bernard is here on the right. And this is Winifred here, and this is Alice in the middle. Now, Alice was a woman of tremendous courage and clarity. She maintained her composure. She cared for the children. She was a huge example of strength. And we'll come back to why that is so important. In 1935, she attended a ladies group at a local Masonic hall. She started speaking with a woman whose husband was a member of the lodge. Uh, Alice told the woman about her recent loss and how they were coping, taking it one week, one day, one prayer at a time. Um, she was really confident that her older daughters, having been through transition of divorce, seemed to be adjusting. Her youngest children, Winifred and, 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 and Winnie and Bernie, were a little too young to process. But Alice was worried about George, George Frederick Toomey. And, and Georgie, as he was called at that time, was 10 years old, and he was struggling to cope. And the woman recommended to so sign George up for a local summer camp. Uh, that it could be a really good thing for him. She spoke of the clean, secluded lake, the canoes. Um, she talked about the meals they eat, the songs they sing. She really was a good, dedicated sales representative for YMCA Camp Dakota. Her name was Frances Elwell, and her husband was Oscar Elwell. And George came to Dakota in 1935. He loved it. Um, he... Um, wasn't the only person to grace the shore, the, 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 the shores of Cass Pond that summer. So Margaret Hanson Mitchell, whose family is related to the Toomeys and has a long history of employment and involvement of our camp, uh, was actually started as the office secretary in the same building that our staff currently use. Um, and so George found himself surrounded by people that he recognized and knew and, 
and was immersed in a supportive and in, in an engaging uh, environment. George came back to camp a couple of times, went through the Keene Public Schools, was a hardworking young man, got a job at the First National Store in Keene. Um, that's the store that he worked in. And he was a jolly good fellow. He loved to get the job done, as his classmates said. Uh, George, uh, after he graduated, worked throughout the summer of 1943 at the Marka Machine Company. Um, and it was, it was a good job. It was, an, it was a job George, uh, you know, he, he liked. On the 8th of November, 1943, George Frederick Toomey enlisted in the United States Naval Reserve. Um, he was promoted to seaman first class on 24 December. Um, he uh, went home to visit the family. They enjoyed hearing him strut around the house in his uniform, hear him talk the Navy, talk to his sisters and brother. Um, and he was, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a good guy. His uh, vacation, though, or liberty, as it was called, was limited. He returned to Newport, um, was transferred to Radio Man School at the Naval Training School in Charleston, South Carolina, on um, the uh, 4th of January. Uh, but this is where it gets tough again. So within days of his arrival, uh, George received some pretty rough news. His sister, Winnie, a wonderful senior at Keene High, had died after a brief battle of spinal meningitis. Um, this was really difficult. Obviously, the, the memories of the death of his father came flooding back. He was granted bereavement leave and traveled home for the funeral. It was a difficult, difficult trip. George grieved the loss of his sister, uh, but knew he had to get back to work. Um, so George returned to Radio Man School in January uh, and goes through his work. After successfully completing Radio Man School, George is transferred to the receiving station, Norfolk, Virginia, to await assignment. On the 30th of May, he's promoted to seaman first class, and he receives orders to the warship USS Underhill, a destroyer escort based out of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, now, the Underhill is one of these ships that was built really quickly uh, at the height of the U-boat campaign. Um, the destroyer escort was a design was very simple. Um, there wasn't much to it. Uh, and George reported on board at the, on the 8th of June, um, he, uh, got to work on board the Underhill. While in Boston, George met a girl named Claire. I, we have a picture of her, uh, here. Um, and while they were never married, it was very clear they were in love. We know that from pictures. We know that. Uh, he, we, from, from the records that we have. And on June 19th, Underhill put to sea and George got his first taste of Navy life. Um, after two weeks of training, um, they, they get to, they start their passage across the Atlantic. Uh, George was very excited to glimpse Gibraltar, we're sure of that, and the mystery, mysterious North African coast. But as the warship entered harbor in Tunisia, See, she struck a submerged wreck, damaging a propeller, so they had to get the ship repaired. Uh, so they essentially um, remained in the Boston Navy Yard for the next three weeks as workers um, She or, or arrived in Boston, back in Boston on the 19th, and, and was repaired over the course of several weeks. Um, they, uh, with the vibration fixed, but now behind schedule, the warship put to sea on 12 September. Uh, and the, they, they, uh, during that crossing on the 20th of September, the crew felt a noticeable jar, um, and they realized later that the sonar dome had broken off the ship. They think the ship hit a whale, which is amazing. She arrives in Plymouth, England, uh, puts into dry dock and gets repaired and goes back out to sea. Um, and this kind of thing goes on and back and forth. They're in Boston, they're out to sea. They're in Boston, they're out to sea. Um, they're in the New York Navy Yard. They're getting fixed. He's writing letters home. In fact, on January the 13th, 1945, he sent a letter home that said, Dear Mom and Burn, boy, it sure feels good to talk to you. I uh, hope everything's okay. You know, when we left New York, we were supposed to go to England. We got a little ways out in the harbor, and what do you know? Something went wrong with one of the screws, and we had to go back. Pretty lucky break, I guess. But what's interesting about that is um, 
if that hadn't happened, the ship may not have been where it was when uh, it eventually gets into trouble because um, the way that her uh, repair schedule went. So on February 8th, Underhill puts back out to sea, uh, escorting the HMS patroller, um, which is a uh, aircraft carrier, a British light aircraft carrier going through the Panama Canal. Uh, and this was the last time um, that George, uh, uh, as he left on that voyage, would see the United States. Writes several more letters home, lots more going on. George continues uh, on board. Um, and um, ends up in a combat situation. So on 22 July, um, the destroyer escort departs uh, Ryukyu Island um, in company with eight smaller patrol craft. So she's left New England, uh, escorted that uh, aircraft carrier you see on the screen now through the Panama Canal, and they've come out into the Pacific. Um, and the commander of one of the escorts immediately noticed that Underhill was a very, very sharp ship. As he later put it in an article, the Underhill, our immediate superior, was well run and in Navy parlance, a happy ship. Um, and he goes on, you can read more of his quote in the story. But given the slow speed of the ships that the Underhill was escorting, progress was limited. Um, the radar air search did their best to keep an eye out. And on the morning of 24 July, one of the patrol craft, submarine chaser, number 1315, broke down and was towed back to Okinawa. And then uh, just after 9 a.m., um, Underhill gets a broadcast that there's a bogey that's been uh, sighted. Um, and the gun crews got ready, but the aircraft seemed to veer away. Uh, and in another sign that the escort was a good ship, Commander Newcomb sent a message to all the smaller escorts. It occurs to me that some of you people might like some ice cream. I will give you five gallons of ice cream to three ships a day in the following order of rotation. Uh, and listed the order in which the ships were to come alongside Underhill and get their ice cream. That's pretty damn nice, said one of the skipper. He didn't have to do a thing like that. But the boys on board the Underhill, they were a good group. Um, on, the af on that afternoon, Underhill was patrolling about 4,000 4, yards ahead of the convoy. Uh, her lookout spotted a mine. They worked their way around it. A few minutes later, um, at 1442, Underhill's sonar team picked up a submarine. At 1445, Underhill's radio man, which actually could have been George, asked a nearby patrol chaser to investigate, uh, and they turned around to investigate. Unfortunately, what they didn't know is that they had stumbled across Japanese submarine I-53, which carried, uh, mo which was modified to carry six Kai-10s, which were anti-ship torpedoes modified to carry a single pilot. So these were um, essentially, you know, kamikaze pilots driving these things right here. So these are the kamikaze, essentially, pilots of these Kai-10 torpedoes, which they would get in and pilot. From there, things started to under uh, started to um, unfold pretty fast. Um, they started to do their best to fight back. Uh, they started chasing these little uh, Kai-10 torpedoes, trying to fire on them. They were going like hell. A minute later, a final broadcast. I wish these little bastards would get out from under us. And at 1507, Underhill's luck finally runs out. One of the um, the Ship is struck by one of the Japanese Kaiten, um, and she breaks apart um, and sinks. And radio man, third class George Frederick Toomey, who is working bravely at his station in the radio room, was killed um, almost instantly. You can see what that room would have looked like. And he went down with the ship. Um, and I want to encourage you to read this story, because not only does this story have a lot of connections to other Tacodians, um, but a lot of George's letters are documented throughout that. Um, we know that on um, 12th of September, 1945, Alice, the mother, received a letter from the Department of Navy. It was accompanied by a brightly colored hand sewn 48 star flag. That flag is in my hands at this very moment. I'm holding it in front of my camera. This flag was actually flowing at Camp Dakota 
last year. And that flag will eventually be entered into the Cheshire County um, archives. This is where I want to finish this story. The loss of George was tremendous. A, a, another wonderful, intelligent young man. The point that I want to make here is that after all of this love and loss, a husband has died, a child has died, now, uh, you know, her daughter's died, now her son has died. Alice, a woman, the mother of tremendous strength, goes on and realizes that she has to do something with this. So she f f uh, is part of the team that forms the New Hampshire Gold Star Mothers Society. And you can actually see Alice standing right here. I'm sorry, right here. Sorry, third from left. That is Alice right there. So she channels all of this love and loss into supporting other people. Um, and it's, it's, it's really quite an amazing story. And I want to encourage you to read it. And I have one thing that I want to share that was related to this. You may have heard earlier, we were talking about the Mitchell family. Well, John, you'll get a kick out of this. So tonight I discovered this is a copy of the handwritten notes. You won't be able to read it, but these are the handwritten notes from Uncle Oscar. And what we noticed was he actually notated the following. On the 7th of May, 1945, Margaret Mitchell's mother phoned to tell us VE Day, Victory in Europe, is official. We all thanked God and pray that Victory in Japan Day might come very soon. So we thought that that was really interesting um, that they notated that in the record books. So, Tim. I wanted you to have time to tell your uncle's story. It's a very powerful story. Um, I don't know if you want to just give us a quick overview of that, but folks, I also want to encourage you to read this story as well. Uh, it's incredible uh, to read. Yeah, you I'll, want to just give us I'll a little short. bit about Alan? I'll be short. Um, so Alan was my uh, uncle, um, my mother's only brother. Uh, she also had a sister. Um, and uh, he, they were born in, um, he was born in 25 and she was born in 27. And um, she, she, she remembered him um, almost like it was yesterday from when they were growing up together. Uh, he, he was always ahead of her, of course, in school, um, the, the big brother. Uh, who always looked out for her, um, but he actually was um, a bit of a charmer. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, always uh, chasing girls, but he he was also a musician, um, uh, a singer. But he was also he like published the school poetry magazine. Um, so he, uh, I think he was also the two of them also were. By the time they got to high school, of course, they they had to do well because, again, their father, my grandfather, was the high school history teacher. Um, and and he so um, he 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 probably laid down the law with them um, a lot a lot. And actually, there's um in one of the in one of the publications um, they put out, uh, which was usually poems or little stories sometimes um, based on you know, war rationing or what have you. Um, but one of the stories, or at one point they said, you know, the government has said that if it's fun, it's out. Uh, but that only goes for the use of cars. We are fully aware of the war and we're not trying to escape it, but we can still have fun and carry on as before. And um, uh, another little piece of his wit from the same publication uh, he and his sister uh, wrote a little poem about their father. There was an old man named Stearns who made many and numerous yearns. It was always his win, any argument to win, and this any senior soon learns. Um, so he, um, he graduates in 1943 and he goes to Phillips Academy uh, that summer, 
uh, and his goal was to join the Foreign Service um, in the State Department. Um, if he could do that, um, and that was partly because um, his father had served in World War I and was a history teacher, um, and I think he sort of wanted to follow in similar footsteps. Um, but uh, given the course of the war, he decides that he's going to join the, uh, the Army Air Forces, uh, which he does in October of 1943, and he wants to become a pilot because um, that's one of the more prestigious um, um, uh, p uh, positions in a crew. Anyway, um, long story, he, he spends time training all throughout the South, in Texas, in the Carolinas, in Georgia, and in every camp he seems to find a girlfriend. Um, and, and wherever the local piano is, so he can, he can play. And he writes these pretty racy letters back to my mother, which I managed to find. Um, and they're always joking back and forth about Southern Bells and are they better than New England girls and all this fun stuff like that. Um, but then um, the, the way the bomber training worked out is uh, the Air Force was taking less, less casualties than they planned. So about half of his classmates were sent to the Army infantry to help prepare for Normandy. Um, so he ended up staying in the air program and ended up being a tail gunner on a B-29 which was also a, little, a technical position because it used automated guns and had a um, radar targeting system. Um, but anyway, so they spend uh, quite a long time in training with these, because these are really advanced aircraft of the time. And he ends up assigned, all the B-29s are assigned to the Pacific. And he, and this is that picture again, he ends up in um, the Marianas in the central position. Pacific, which was the main um, B-29 base for bombing missions over Japan. And so they actually begin their first flight, uh, first bombing mission only in July of 1945, or the end of June 1945. Um, and he, his plane only does, I think, four missions. And on the fourth mission, which is 26th of July 1945, so literally three weeks before the end of the war, although they don't know it at the time. Um, there's a 300 plane raid, raid on the city of Amuta in southern Japan, the island of Kyushu, and only one plane is shot down and it's his. Um, and what I managed to do, because I had found um, some letters that he had written home, and my grandmother had typed them onto onion skin, and I found the box in my in my mother's cabinet and they didn't know for the longest time they did not know what had happened to Alan. So I actually went to the National Archives and managed to look through literally 30 linear feet of records and discovered that when his plane was shot down about half the crew had been captured by the Japanese um, and had survived and he was one of the survivors. And they uh, ended up at um, what's called Western Army Headquarters on Kyushu. And the, the Japanese were furiously planning for an American invasion. Um, and so they didn't have a lot of time for prisoners. And they were deciding what to do with them. And then after the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, um, they actually executed some of the prisoners without trial, so it was an illegal execution. Uh, and then they did that again on 12th August, um, after these officers' mothers had been killed in a bombing raid. Uh, and then sort of the, the to, to cap the tragedy, on the 15th, after the Emperor of Japan announces that Japan is going to surrender, the officers decide to kill the rest of the prisoners to cover up the fact that they had committed war crimes. So Allen was either killed on the 12th or the 15th. Um, there's really no way to tell from the records. And um, his, all the bodies were cremated and um, um, 
dispersed in the in the ocean. So like like the other Navy uh, sailors who are in unmarked graves in the waters, Alan ended up there as well, um, off the coast of Japan. Uh, actually, probably reasonably close to where Paraday ended up. Um, what sort of the uh, on a more positive note, after it, it takes a number of years actually before he's declared killed in action. Um, but in at his memorial service, his parents, my grandparents, actually presented a um, a large uh, organ um, a musical organ organ to the high school, and so it it actually was in the music department in Keene High School for many decades after the war. Um, So there's, um, and, the, and the last thing is that one of the things that struck me the most when I was writing Alan's history was a letter, the last letter from the War Department in 1947, which, which basically changed his status from MIA to KIA. Uh, it ended with this paragraph, which I uh, have always remembered. If in the end, we learned that it has cost us your son's life to win back freedom and peace. Then through our tears, let us take pride in his noble sacrifice and let us use and let us to use and to preserve that peace and freedom that all that all of his heroic comrades may not have given their lives in vain. You know, so it was the people who have survived and had been through that terrible war, were, were dedicating themselves to make something of the peace that they had earned, um, that all their comrades had sacrificed their lives. And you know, if you think about how the United States has prospered and the role that we've played in creating a better world um, since the 1930s, uh, I think we have done uh, we've done that job, and those of us who still serve or who have served in between, um, any other veterans on this call, you know, I always keep that in mind as well, that we, we stand on the shoulders of their sacrifices. So Thank anyway, you, I, so this, this always, it means a lot to me. Thank you for well, listening. Well, thank you, Tim, for sharing Alan's legacy with us, and, and certainly thank you for your service as well. The last of our lost Dakotians was Thomas Aaron Eaton, born 1925. Um, Thomas is, is yet another one of these wonderfully smart young men um, who uh, was actually one of the Dakotians who saw camp both before and, and after the hurricane. Um, and he went on to serve um, in Guam. Um, he was actually still active as the war was wrapping up and was ending um, and was remained there because he fell in love. Um, and you can see this is his wife, Catalina, um, and their baby, Thomas, who I have gotten to know. This picture of Thomas is the very first picture of the Lost Dakotians we ever found. His was the first face we saw. When I first saw it, I thought he was like given a middle finger. That's what I, it looks like at first. But then I thought it was a banana. Then somebody pointed out it's an ear of corn. Um, so um, he was actually, I got to change that. He was actually um, died in a Jeep accident in 1946. But his story is great. After the war, um, Memorial Lodge was constructed and dedicated in 1946 to honor uh, the uh, 44 Tacodians that had died since our founding. But the lodge was actually built um, by veterans who had come back from the war and didn't have a job and needed something to do. So Oscar hired them and gave them camp to use as breathing room as a place to kind of rehabilitate and, and, and get, get used to be, being part of society again. Uh, it gave them some breathing room. And on July the 28th, 1946, um, camp was dedicated. You can read about that dedication ceremony 
on the loss to Cody Inn's website. And it was dedicated for these 12 amazing young men. Memorial Lodge stands to this day. It is a favorite among Tacodians. It is an absolutely beautiful and peaceful spot. And one of the things that we did uh, as part of this research project was to very carefully remove the plaque and put it through a series of chemical tests uh, to the point that we could beautifully restore it. And it is shining and in the lodge at this very, very moment. Um, we did a ceremony, Tim, I'm just going to go through this stuff pretty quickly. We did a ceremony last year uh, in which we reunited the families. Um, you can see this is me here. This is my brother. Clearly, I'm much better looking. Uh, that's the important part. But we had the military come in and help us with this ceremony in which we honored these families. Some of you who are on the phone joined us there. We uh, did our best to not only honor these men, but recreate little pieces of the original dedication ceremony. Since then, we've visited five out of 12 grave sites, and we have left granite CT markers um, at each one, along with new flags. We visited the graves of Toomey, Robinson, Lancy, Kingsbury, <clears throat> and just this week, my wife Carrie and I visited William T. Burroughs Jr., and you can see his granite CT is there. The remaining seven are buried overseas or were buried at sea, or they have no known marker. But Tim and I have a long-term goal, which is to visit every single one of the graves, markers, cenotaphs, and resting sites as close as we can get. New research and discoveries are coming in all the time from the National Records Association, our National Archives and Records uh, Association, and the Department of Defense, and many, many more. In fact, this fuzzy-looking picture is a never-before-seen photo of Raymond Kreps that we recently acquired. We think it was taken for an ID. It was a tiny little thing affixed to a piece of paper, and we were able to capture it, uh, it uh, take the negative, uh, uh, reverse it, blow it up, and we could clearly see it was Kreps himself. The next step for the project is that Tim and I are hoping to um, either produce a documentary, which are, we are currently working to pitch, um, and also work to um, uh, look at expanding the material into a book. This is the original Camp Dakota honor roll. I told you there were 44 names. You can see uh, the names with the stars next to them are the 12 Dakotians. Uh, Merrill's star is a little hard to see, but it's there. But this was the honor roll that was hanging in Mem Lodge that day. I, I know some questions have been answered. If you have additional questions, I, I think we're getting a little late, but you can certainly submit those questions um, uh, through uh, camp or we, I, I can hang on for a couple of extra minutes and answer some questions. And I'd be happy to, uh, to do that. I'm sure Tim would as well. Um, but remember that Dakota is not just our history, it is also yours. It is a place of extraordinary beauty, of amazing history, and we are an incredible community. So I want to encourage you that if you have a story to tell, uh, we want you to share that story with us, especially if you think it will lead us down the path of learning something new. As our historian, I assure you that is of great importance. All right, here's my embarrassing moment. There's me during my very first day at camp with my black guy and missing teeth. I don't know what my older brother did to me, but what probably wasn't good. Uh, this, was this picture was taken. Um, I'm standing in the exact same spot. This was last year, actually. I just realized I'm wearing the same shirt. That's also embarrassing. Uh, we've got another Dakota history talk coming up. Uh, the Tale of Two Dakotas will be going through the hurricane of 1938 on the 10th of June. But if there's something else you'd like us to cover, you can let me know or you can let camp know. I'm gonna hang on in case you have any questions. Otherwise, I thank all of you who hung on for as long as you did. I know we went way past 8.30. And as you could tell, Tim and I could have talked for hours more, uh, but I really appreciate you joining us. Tim, thank you so much for being on this journey. Uh, my World War II families, uh, we care about you very much and appreciate you joining us on this journey. For those of you who have joined us to hear some of these stories for the first time, I encourage you to go to the Lost Dakotian site and read them all. Tim, any final thoughts? No, just uh, thank you for everyone for listening. And um, uh, I, re I really appreciate um, I really appreciate that. And the, the story of your camp is a wonderful one. Um, you have a great community. Um, and it, it, um, it's great to be a part of that. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. So as we say, day is done, gone the sun.
Good night to Codians. Brian, if you want to stop the recording, I'll hang on in case there's any questions. Thank you very much.